Assalamualaikum. Uh, I want to begin by reading two verses from the Quran. Uh, you can Google these verses. They are chapter 3, verses 113 and 114. So if you go to Google, just type Quran 3 colon 113, 3 colon 114, they will pop up. This is what the verses say. They are not alike, all the people of the book. Among them, there is a group that is an upright party. They recite the name of God and they worship Him and adore Him all night. They believe in God in the last day. They encourage people to do what is good and they forbid people from doing what is wrong. They strive with each other in encouraging everyone to do good and they are people from among the good people. This is what the Quran is saying about the people of the book, which means Christians and Jews. About 10 years ago, I would use this verse and half jokingly and half seriously say what the Quran is saying is there are some good people of the book. <laughs> and they are very good. And I would contrast that from Europeans. Because Europe was Islamophobia or Islamophobic. Europe was racist. Europe was anti-Semitic. It was not a matter. So I said good people of the book were on this side of the Atlantic. But unfortunately I'm now beginning to be history is questioning that assessment. Uh, uh, just listening to Donald Trump, <laughs> I feel alien to this country, to this culture. It feels like we're on a different planet altogether. Uh, and I find it quite bizarre, and I realize that this word Islamophobia is actually completely incorrect. Because nobody is afraid of Muslims. It's the Muslims here who are afraid of what's going on in this country. So it's the other way around, you know, so we have to understand the context. But talking about good people of the book, I want to thank June for coordinating this. I want to thank the people who are part of the movement for peace and culture. We have worked on several projects before and we will continue, inshallah, to work on projects together. So yes, there are a lot of good people in, in America and, and uh, in the world. Events like this are itself a proof against what we are doing today. If we are here to lament Islamophobia, uh, prejudice, contempt, anger, hatred of Muslims and Islam, then this event itself is an evidence against the case that we are making because there are so many people who are coming out there to stand up with Muslims and say Islamophobia is something that should be completely rejected. Isn't that why you're here? Good. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure that that is why we are here. And it is that reason why that uh, we decided to show you who Muslims of Delaware are. You saw young and younger and even younger Muslims of Delaware. We are pretty normal people. And that's the main point that we want to say. We think about this country the way you think. We think about life the way most people do. We think about God the way you all do, and if you don't, then you better start thinking about God the way we do. <laughs> it's in your own good. <laughs> I assure you of that. So that, that's the basic point that we are trying to make in this panel. I also want to read you a paragraph. Please bear with me to take about a minute. It's important for you to listen very carefully when I tell you what that paragraph is. Islamophobia is witnessing a spectacular growth in the American public sphere. It creates an environment that casts suspicion on all Muslims, demonizes their faith, and makes their life difficult in small and big ways. There are increasingly incidents of discrimination while traveling in the job market and while re-entering the country after foreign trips. Every time Muslims try to construct a place of worship, it is being used as an opportunity for Islam bashing and to garner political capital at the expense of Muslims. Law enforcement agencies, even though they enjoy a great deal of cooperation from the community, continue to use religious profiling as a tool against Muslims. The systematic and steady, systematic and steady erosion of Muslim civil rights is also a slow and systematic corrosion of our own constitution and of our democracy. Dear members of the Senate Judiciary Committee on Constitution, as members of the United States Senate, you all have sworn to uphold and defend the U.S. Constitution. The biggest threat to the Constitution today manifests as Islamophobia. 
protect the constitution by rejecting Islamophobia. This is the concluding paragraph of a testimony that I gave to U.S. Senate uh, Constitution Committee. But this was in 2011. So when I was preparing for the talk, it just, I just remembered, oh, I have only testified to the Senate on Islamophobia. Let me see what I said in 2011. This is before Trump. This is before New Gingrich ran for president. And I was horrified because I cannot write anything more powerful than what I wrote five years ago. And that is a scary part to me that things have become worse than what they were five years ago. And all of these things are still valid. And that's why I thought it was important for me to rehash this past history to show that we have to be on a slippery slope going down here as far as the U.S. is There are many reasons why there is Islam. And part of it is because not only of what is happening in the Muslim world, but also what is happening here. Events such as the Boston uh, Marathon shooting in 9 11, San Bernardino event, etc., are not good advertisements for Islam or Muslims or for humanity as such. And they will generate fear, anger, etc. But that is not what the problem really is. In the last 20 years, toddlers have shot and killed more Americans than Muslims. Toddlers shot more people. The chance that you will kill yourself is thousands of times more probability than you will be killed by an American Muslim. The probability of your committing suicide is much, much more higher than Muslims. There have been more than 355 mass shootings in 2003. Thousands of people literally have been killed by gun violence. So it's not just that we are afraid of violence. It's not that the fact that Muslims have killed less than 55 people in the last 15 years since 9-11. Even 55 is very bad, but that does not justify the extent of hatred and contempt for Islam and Muslims that we are witnessing today. Because what happened was it started in 2012, a little before that, where Islamophobia became a Republican Party's campaign strategy. You saw that in the election with all the focus on Ground Zero Mosque. Nobody cares about Ground Zero Mosque. Next time you're back, just check and send us a picture of oh, what's going on there. No one knows. They shut it down. No one seems to care about what's happening with the Ground Zero Mosque today. But in 2011, it was the biggest issue. You give it to run it on that. I remember answering a lot of media interviews. I wrote a lot about Islam for the 2012 election with the Kubernetes pop up. And my first answer to every reporter was, why didn't you call me in the first week of December and then we we'll talk about the Ground Zero Mosque? Of course, no one has ever talked about the Ground Zero Mosque after November 2012, once the election was done. So it started with this. But what it did was when Newt Gingrich and people like uh, Congressman Wells in California, in Florida, others started openly making anti Muslim statements. Even Senator McCain came out and said that he thinks that America's president should be Christian. When they started making it, it became mainstream. So people spouting anti Muslim statements were not free radicals, but they were mainstream leaders who were aspiring to become president of this country. So at the beginning of 2000, it became a political strategy. But now it's unbelievable. Now it's a competition. What is the, the, the GOP nomination is like, who hates Muslims most? That's what the contest has become. I hate Muslims most. No, no, I do. No, 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 I do. Well, maybe a little less than Trump, but I do too. Everyone seems to be going out. There's this moment in the debate that just happened without Trump in which Megyn Kelly basically is asking the question. They saw packages being unloaded, they saw Muslims, and they didn't call the police, they didn't do anything. So apparently if you see a Muslim in the package, you are supposed to call. I, that's why I was trying to hide my bag. <laughs> you are supposed to call the police. I mean, what is this? this thing, what is interesting is that in this country, we are supposed to be stifled by political correctness. Isn't that one of the... Uh, problem that some people have about our country that we are too politically correct. If we are too politically correct, yet people are able to make such profoundly bigoted comments. Just replace the word Muslim with Jew or black and see what how it sounds. 
You saw a Jew and you saw a man and you didn't call the police? See? Is there anybody who would not consider that statement as anti Semitic? But you can run for a president to position in this country and raise money. The only time Ben Carson had a spike in fundraising or peers time was when he said that Muslims should not be in the White House. So what has happened is that it has gone from beyond being uh, a campaign strategy, something more profound, it has become a public policy. But I also think that Islamophobia is becoming a day to redefine America. Islamophobia is a strategy now to redefine America as a Christian country. Basically, the point is that if you're not a Christian, then you're not welcome. You're not an American. So those of you who don't subscribe to this idea that America should be a Christian nation are being taken for a ride by those who are using Islamophobia as a strategy to <coughs> fundamentally alienate and make it strange that it is fundamentally American. Islam is not new to this country. You know, I say half jokingly that Obama is the second Muslim president of the United States. <laughs> but if you read the Jefferson Bible, the only thing that he knocked off is things which are inconsistent with the Quran. The Jefferson Bible is completely in line with the Quran. Google Ben Franklin's creed. Ben Franklin was asked this question about religion in, in America and he described his creed, it's unbelievable. He just described Islam. He including he described Jesus as a prophet, not of God. So very much like a Muslim would describe. They were important of faith. If you go and read Madison and you read the, the Federalist Papers, there were lots of discussions. In fact, the founding fathers discussed the possibility of a Muslim getting elected to the White House, and they raised the question, should we ban Muslims from being president? And they decided no. That if people are going to elect somebody called Hussein to the White House, then they may. It's popular that he be president, or her be president. So Islam has been part of this country from the very beginning. There's a mural or a painting uh, at the Supreme Court which talks about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a lawgiver of this land. Americans were recognizing the contribution of Islam to America long before Muslims became very visible. The first book with the title Islam in America was written in 1908 by an American called Alexander Webb. I found a copy of the Quran, which I started bidding on eBay, and after $6,000 I stopped. <laughs> that was my life savings, I couldn't go beyond that. I later found out that somebody bought it and presented it to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf in California. It went off for like hundred thousand dollars or something. So why were Muslims bidding for this Quran? The reason why they were bidding is not for the old copy. The front page of the copy said that this copy of the Quran is being printed in Massachusetts in 1773 because of the tremendous demand for Quran in America. There was so much demand that they had to commercially print Quran in the United States. So given these things, what I want you to understand is Islam is not an alien religion. Some of the most wonderful Americans are Muslims, <coughs> Muhammad Ali. So what is happening then? Why is there so much Islamophobia? Islamophobia is not just fear of Islam and Muslims. It involves all negative values, such as hatred, such as contempt. It's a reflection of ignorance. It's a celebration of ignorance. We are living in a society that is becoming increasingly dumb. I find it fascinating that if you were to list 100 experts in any field, in every field, I think 60 to 70 are in America. In every field. And if you look legally and otherwise, there is no country on earth which is more free than America. In terms of freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, America is still the freest country. In spite of the fact that we have the most experts on everything, in spite of the fact we have the biggest or the most profoundest freedom 
available in our public sphere, we have the dumbest discourse on earth. <laughs> Right? 
two elements of the Christian Sharia cannot be opposed, be imposed in this country by 70% of the Christian population, partly because they don't agree all of them on this, then how do you expect 1% of the population which is Muslim to impose 100% of the Sharia on the rest of the 99% of the American population? You don't have to be Umar Khayyam to do the map. <laughs> right? You can do it at fourth grade level. <laughs> so that's one thing that you have to understand. That. So why are people doing this? Because of the spectacle. They think that it makes them look acceptable to America if they are anti-Muslim. And that is the biggest fear. That being prejudicial and bigoted is okay. Not only that it's okay, but it's a winning strategy. That is the biggest damage that we are doing to our country. And the third and most important thing that you need to understand is that America is not a nation state. We are the first and perhaps the most successful multicultural state. That means what binds us together is not our religious identity or our ethnic identity or our racial identity. The only thing that brings us together and makes an Ummah out of us, makes a nation out of us, is our shared values. And the most important of that shared value is freedom of religion. And if you're going to compromise that for Muslims, you might as well throw the First Amendment out of the window. And that is the most important thing. So when I come in front of you and invite you and beg you and ask you to join me, in my fight against Islamophobia in this country, what I'm merely saying is, I'm trying to save your country. Come join me in saving our country. Thank you.